This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream, where you can get the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for our viewers, you can enter the promo code BRAINFOOD when prompted during the sign-up process, and your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. When the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889, it was intended to function as the entrance arches to the World's Fair in Paris. It was never meant to be permanent. In fact, it only had a permit to stay standing for 20 years until 1909. This was a good thing, according to many Parisians who thought of the structure as a bit of an eyesore. This included famed author Guy de Maupassant, who said of it, What will be thought of our generation if we do not smash this Langy pyramid? In fact, a group of artists and architects from France actually submitted a group letter to the Minister of Works and the Commissioner for the Exposition against it being built in the first place, writing, We writers, painters, sculptors, architects, and passionate devotees of the hitherto untouched beauty of Paris protest with all our strength, with all our indignation, in the name of slighted French taste, against the erection of this useless and monstrous Eiffel Tower. To bring our arguments home, imagine for a moment a giddy, ridiculous tower dominating Paris like a gigantic black smokestack crushing under its barbaric bulk Notre Dame, the Tour Saint-Jacques, the Louvre, the Tome of les Invalides, the Arc de Triomphe. All of our humiliated monuments will disappear in this ghastly dream. And for 20 years we shall see stretching like a blot of ink the hateful shadow of the hateful column of bolted sheet metal. Nevertheless, it was built anyway, and due to the value provided for radio transmissions and tourism, the city of Paris kept it erect. So this all brings us to May of 1925, when one Victor Lustig first conceived the scheme that would make him a legend. With documents and letterheads proclaiming him the deputy director of the Ministry of Postal Services and Telecommunications, Lustig sent out notes to prominent Paris scrap metal businesses urgently asking them to meet him at the Hotel de Crillon. Six dealers came, curious about what the French government wanted with them. After an expensive meal and plenty of wine, Lustig declared, in his typical charismatic fashion, that the city of Paris was going to knock down the Eiffel Tower and sell it for scrap metal. This was a huge secret that the public could not know of at this point, but he wanted the scrap metal businesses to bid against one another to see who would get this extremely valuable contract. Negotiations began in earnest, with André Poisson winning the bid for $70,000, about a million dollars today. It was a lot of money, but to Poisson, who was new in town and wanted to establish a reputation, it was worth the huge contract. But there was one big problem. Victor Lustig did not work for the ministry. In fact, he didn't work for the government at all. Victor Lustig was a con man. Born in Arno, Austria-Hungary, today Hostene in Czech Republic in 1890, not much is known of Lustig's childhood besides the fact that he was born Robert V. Miller to an upper-middle-class family. At an early age, he decided to travel the world. In order to finance his adventures, he took to conning rich people. Fluent in several languages due to the varied cultures of his homeland, he rode ocean liners between Europe and America, playing the part of a rich, free-spending young man, and gave himself the moniker of Count. The Count would wine, dine, and charm potential marks until eventually conversation turned to his line of work and the source of his obvious wealth. Reluctant and asking for utmost secrecy, he would reveal his money box, also known as a Romanian box. A well-known con, the money box was essentially a fake money printer, spitting out bills that were hidden inside the machine. The contraption was made out of beautiful mahogany and was the size of a steamer trunk. He would ask his mark for a $100 bill, insert it into the machine, wait a few hours for chemical processing, and when they came back out, two of the bills would emerge. As Lustig would put it, the box literally paid for itself and then some. The enterprising new friends of Lustig would beg him to sell it, despite Lustig's reluctance. After much cajoling and rising bids, Lustig would agree to sell it for sometimes up to $30,000. After a few more test runs and a few more hundred-dollar bills, Lustig would depart the ship and leave the money box with its new owners. It would only be a matter of time before they realized that it was a scam, but it didn't matter. Lustig, he was already gone, and on to the next one. His coup de grace of cons came when he was reading a newspaper article about the Eiffel Tower. The article remarked on the high cost of maintenance and repairs of the tower, making mention that it was rusting. As previously noted, many Parisians thought of it as a huge eyesore at this time, which gave Lustig the big idea. Despite the interest of the six Parisian scrap metal dealers, Lustig had already identified his mark, André Poisson. As mentioned, Poisson was new to the business community and was wanting to make a bit of a splash. As the Count had suspected when he took all of the potential contractors to the tower in a limo 
Nemo for a tour, it was Poisson who very clearly was the most serious about winning the contract. However, Poisson's wife, she wasn't so sure. She thought the whole thing seemed a bit fishy, with all the secrecy and the quick-moving nature of the deal. To calm her fears, the Count arranged a meeting where he confessed. Lustig explained to Poisson and his wife that he was but a lowly bureaucrat, expected to impress, but hardly making enough to pay his bills. Thus, beyond any orders for normal discretion when facilitating contracts like this one, he tended to like to keep things extremely quiet on closing the deal to avoid unwanted attention. Poisson knew exactly what this meant. Lustig was open to bribes. Poisson and his wife, actually rather relieved, obliged giving the Count 50 grand to make sure that Poisson would win the bid. Adding in the 20 grand for the actual contract, Lustig had 70 grand or about a million dollars today in his hands. Within an hour of receiving the money, the Count left Paris. Shocking despite the huge sum that had changed hands, upon realizing that he had been had, Poisson decided to keep his mouth shut. The money was probably gone either way, but at least by keeping quiet, he could keep himself from becoming the laughing stock of the Parisian business world. So in the end, the price of being embarrassed and potentially arrested for bribery made it not worth it. As it had worked out so well the first time, Lustig decided to try it again. Only six months later, he returned to Paris with the same letterheads and summoned five new scrap metal businesses. He wined and dined them just like before, but as a deal was being consummated with one of the iron dealers, another one became suspicious. He contacted the police. When Lustig caught wind of it, he abandoned the deal and fled in a hurry to the United States, presumably on one of the ocean liners where he'd got his start. If one thought the Count had learned his lesson, they would be sorely mistaken. He once again turned to the money box for his scams. Taking on dozens of aliases and enduring several arrests, including one that landed him in the same Indiana jail as former professional baseball player turned famed gangster in the offseason, John Dillinger. The Count swindled innocent folks in Indiana, Nebraska, Texas, and Chicago, including one Texas sheriff who followed him across the country, only to finally catch him and be tricked again when Lustig convinced him it was the sheriff who had failed to work the machine properly. Sometime prior to 1930, he even reportedly scammed the most famous gangster of our time, Al Capone. The story goes that he convinced Capone to give him 50 grand with a promise to double his money in 60 days with his newest venture. Knowing full well Capone's dangerous reputation, he let the money sit in a bank account for 59 days. He then came back to Capone to tell him the deal had fallen through and that he'd lost the funds, but was willing to repay the invested amount out of his own pocket. Capone evidently was so impressed with Lustig's integrity that he only made him pay back about 45 to 49 thousand dollars of the money reports vary on the exact amount that Capone let him keep. It's a tidy little profit for the con man's minimal effort. As Lustig grew more confident and arrogant in his abilities, so did his risks, which led him to eventually be in court and given a substantial prison sentence. In 1930, he teamed up with a Nebraskan chemist named Tom Shaw and began a real counterfeit operation. This involved paper, plates, ink, the whole nine yards. The bills looked so real that they were able to release up to $100,000 a month into the U.S. economy, which is about $1.4 million today. This much money was never going to escape the eyes of the Secret Service. Lustig money kept showing up from New Orleans to Chicago. Even so, the Secret Service got a little help in catching the man behind it all. You see, when Lustig's girlfriend suspected him of cheating on her, she turned him in. With her help, the Secret Service was able to catch him strolling down Broadway on New York's Upper West Side. With a briefcase full of expensive clothes and no hint of nervousness, a Secret Service agent remarked to the Count that, You're the smoothest con man that ever lived. Lustig, he wasn't done yet, though. He somehow escaped jail via a bedsheet rope, but was caught in Pittsburgh a month later. He was then sentenced to 20 years in the most famous prison of them all. Alcatraz. There he lived for the rest of his days. Despite his success as a con artist, his death attracted no real public attention in the beginning. First reported to the public in a New York Times article from August 31, 1949, in which Lustig's brother told a judge that the famed Count had passed away two years earlier in prison. So just before we get to the bonus facts for today's episode, I do want to say that it's brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals, by the way. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, which I don't know about you, but I've got other streaming services which are a lot more expensive than that, and the documentary selection is not so hot. Plus, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code brainfood or one word 
It's a great way to support this show for free. Like I say, you get those 30 days, but it's probably not actually free because I think you'll like it and you'll stick with it and keep on paying. If you're looking for a specific recommendation on the platform, why not check out Digits? It's hosted by Derek from Veritasium, another great YouTube channel. It looks at a lot of internet related stuff. It's kind of hard to describe, but it covers things from like the internet of things to the surveillance culture that we all live in. It's a great watch and you can do that in your free trial, but there's also loads of other great stuff to watch as well if that doesn't appeal. So like I said, go to curiositystream.com forward slash brain food, enter the promo code brain food for 30 days for free, link below. And let's get into those bonus facts. It's generally thought that Lustig is the author of the Ten Commandments for Con Men. They go as such. Be a patient listener. It is this not fast talking that gets a con man his coups. Never look bored. Wait for the other person to reveal any political opinions, then agree with them. Let the other person reveal religious views, then have the same ones. Hint at sex talk, but don't follow up on it unless the other person shows a strong interest. Never discuss illness unless some special concern is shown. Never pry into a person's personal circumstances, they'll tell you all eventually. Never boast, just let your importance be quietly obvious. Never be untidy. Never get drunk. Given how he got caught, maybe you should have added, never cheat on a woman who knows all about your scams. Hell hath no fury and all that. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos every day of the week. Also, why not check out my other channel? It's called Highlight History. Sort of today in history thing. I'm linking to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.